In this video, we're going to cover the most important functions for financial modeling. Preparing this video has been a little nostalgic for me with the financial functions taking me back to my accounting days. That said, most of the functions I cover will also apply to all areas of your Excel work, not just modeling. Now be sure to download the example Excel file from the link in the video description. You can use it to practice and as a reference in the future. Okay, let's get the easy functions out of the way. Sum, min, max, average and count all aggregate values and are functions every Excel user needs. They're super easy to use, so I won't spend long on them. And because they all have the same syntax, once you know one, you can use them all. Taking the sum function as an example, we can manually type the values in, separate by commas. Just kidding, don't do that. It's more efficient to reference cells containing the values that you want to sum. Then if they change, the formula automatically picks up the changes. Now with these functions, we can reference non-contiguous cells and ranges of non-contiguous cells by separating them with a comma, or we can reference the entire range, which is what I want to do here. And you can see these other functions work in the same way. Okay, you probably knew all that, but most people don't know that the sum function has some hidden shortcuts that I've covered in another video, which is linked to in the video description. So be sure to check that out. Conditional ifs functions like sum ifs enables you to aggregate cells where they meet one or more criteria. So taking the data here, I want to sum ifs, the totals, that's my first argument. And let's F4 to absolute. My first criteria is where the region F4 to absolute, comma, matches the region here, absolute that with F4, and my next criteria is where the builder, F4 to absolute that, matches the builder here. And I don't need to absolute that because I'm going to copy this formula down. Press enter. You can see nothing matches for the first one. Let's right click and drag. I'm just going to fill without formatting. So you can see Dave is the only builder who meets both the criteria of East and the matching builder name, and it's returned his total sales accordingly. If I change the region, we now have two matches, Doug and Brian. And as we can see with some ifs, all criteria must be met for the formula to include the values in the sum. Now, if you require all criteria, then you can use the sum product function. And I've put a link to a tutorial on sum product here in this workbook and in the video description. So now that you know how to use sum ifs, you'll find the other ifs functions like min ifs, max ifs, average ifs, and count ifs use exactly the same syntax, so you can give them a try in your own time. Let's start with the if function, which enables you to perform a logical test and then return one of two results depending on the outcome of the logical test. For example, let's say we want to classify these items as due or not due, and an item becomes due 90 days after the loan date. We can see the if formula takes three arguments, the logical test, the result if the logical test is true, and the result if the logical test is false. Therefore, the formula is if today's date, and I can use the today function, minus the loan date is greater than or equal to 90, then this book is due. Otherwise, we'll just return blank. Close parentheses, and you can see we've got three books that are due. Now, instead of returning blank, I could return some other text or a number in there. So we could say not due and it returns the results accordingly. Okay, so that's a quick example of single if formula. Let's take a look at nested ifs. Nested ifs allow you to handle more logical tests and return different results accordingly. For example, let's say loan items greater than 90 days old are classified as overdue. Items equal to 90 days old are classified as due, and items less than 90 days old are not due. We'll start with our first if, which is, is today's date minus the loan date greater than 90? In which case it's overdue. And then in the value of false argument, we simply enter another if statement. And we perform our next test, which is if today's date minus the loan date is equal to 90, then it's due. And if that's false, then everything else must be not due. So we don't need a third logical test. We just enter the value in the value of false. Close my second if and close my first if, press enter, and the formula copies down. 
Now it's essential that you get the order of the logical tests in a nested if formula correct because as soon as a logical test returns true, the formula stops evaluating. It's not so much an issue with this formula, but it's a common mistake I see people make and they wonder why their formulas only return the first result. Now, if you have Excel 2019 onward or a Microsoft 365 license, then you have access to the new and easier to use ifs formula. The ifs formula simplifies nesting ifs. For example, we can write exactly the same formula in groups of logical tests and the result if true. So remember my first logical test is, is today's date minus the loan date greater than 90? If so, this is overdue. And then my next logical test is, is today's date minus the loan date equal to 90? Then this is due. And lastly, because there's no value if false argument in the ifs formula, we skip the last logical test and simply enter true. And then the last value if true is the value we want returned in the event that the previous logical tests return false. In this case, I want not due. Close parentheses on ifs and we get the same results. Now I should point out that just like the nested ifs formula, ifs also stops evaluating once a logical test evaluates to true. So remember to get your logical tests in the correct order. For more on the if function and common mistakes people make, see the link in the video description for my comprehensive tutorial. The next step up from if formulas is to use the and function and or function in your criteria arguments. Let's take a look at that next. We'll start with the AND function, which belongs to the logic family of formulas. It's useful when you have multiple conditions that must be met. For example, taking the data here, we could test to see if the TV personality is popular and if they earn less than 100K. If both tests are true, they get a bonus. So to write the formula, starting with IF, and then we want AND criteria. So if the TV personality is popular, so if it equals yes, AND, if their salary, which is under here, is less than 100, close parentheses on AND. If both of those are true, then we're going to take the salary times 10% as their bonus. Otherwise, they get nil. We'll just enter it as text. Close parentheses on IF, press ENTER, and you can see there are three TV personalities that get the bonus. Now you can nest more criteria in the AND function if required. You can see here we can continue adding them as needed. The OR function is useful when you're happy if one or another condition is met. For example, taking the data here, we could test to see if the TV personality is popular or if they earn less than 100K. As long as either of those tests are met, they get a bonus. So using OR, if they're popular, or if their salary is less than 100, then they're going to get a bonus of 10%. Otherwise, they'll get nil. Close parentheses, and it copies down. You can see everyone gets a bonus except for Spider-Man. And like with AND, you can nest more logical tests in OR as required. And you could also use both AND and OR criteria. And if you're struggling to write if formulas, we've written an if formula builder tool that you can use to write if formulas for you. You can download it from the link in the video description. XLOOKUP is the new improved version of VLOOKUP available in Excel 2021 and 365. And now if you don't have one of these versions of Excel, you can still use the VLOOKUP function or index and match, which I'll cover next. XLOOKUP enables you to look up a value, let's say we want to look up gloves, in a list, here's the list, and return a value in the column that you select. Close parentheses, and you can see it returns 90,700, so it's pretty straightforward. Now there is a lot more to XLOOKUP, including the optional arguments, which I didn't cover here, and why it's better than VLOOKUP. So I encourage you to watch my comprehensive XLOOKUP video tutorial linked to in the video description. Now, if you don't have XLOOKUP, you can use VLOOKUP. So again, we're going to look up gloves. This time though, with VLOOKUP, we need to select a table array. And the first column of that array needs to be the column that your lookup item is in. So that's this column here. And then extend the range to include the column that you want returned. So that's my lookup array. The column index number, it's the second column in that array. And I want an exact match, so that's false. Close parentheses, and we get the same result. 
Now there are some other ways you can use VLOOKUP which you can learn from the VLOOKUP tutorial linked to in the video description. Now a more robust lookup formula option available to those who don't have XLOOKUP is index and match. So let's look at match first. For example, we can look up the value here, Batman, in the range of programs and we want an exact match so that's zero, close parentheses, we can see that Batman is on the second row of that range. Similarly, we can use match to look up columns. Let's say we want to look up east in this range here. And again, an exact match, close parentheses. We can see that east is in the second column. And if we look at index, let's say we want to index this table and we want to find the item on row two and column two, close parentheses, and we get 102 which is the value for Batman in the East region. Now we can make the formula dynamic by using match to find the row and column numbers. So instead of referencing the cells, we can replace them with the formulas. So here it'll be match Batman in this column and an exact match. And instead of referencing the result there, we can again use match to find the region in these columns here and find an exact match. And now with it linked to these cells, we can change the selection and you can see the index function automatically updates. Now, if there's one function that you should really take the time to learn, it's the index function. It can do way more than lookups. And in my opinion, it's the most useful function in Excel. I've recorded a video on the five things most people don't know about index, which you can see at the link in the video description. There are a ton of financial functions in Excel. In this video, I'll cover some of the functions you're most likely to use as a financial modeler, namely periodic payment, present value, net present value, and internal rate of return. Now I should point out that I'll be teaching you how to use Excel functions to calculate these common metrics, as opposed to teaching you the accounting concepts behind them. Okay, starting with the PMT function, which is used to calculate the periodic payment for a loan or investment. It can be used to model debt repayments or investment returns in a financial model. Now it takes the interest rate for the payment period. I'm doing mine monthly, so I've divided the annual rate by 12. And then the number of payments, for example, a 20 year loan with monthly repayments, that'd be 240 payments. And then the principal or loan amount, my loans are 500,000. And then there are two optional arguments, the final balance or target. For example, there might be a balloon payment at the end of the loan period. In this example, I want to repay the full amount, so it's zero. And finally, when the payments are due, zero is entered for the end of the period and one for the beginning of the period. Close parentheses, and we can see that the monthly repayments on this loan are $3,582.16. The PV function calculates the present value of a loan or an investment based on a constant interest rate. You can use PV with either periodic or constant payments like mortgages or other loans or a future value that's your investment goal. In this example, we'll calculate the present value for a series of monthly loan repayments. So it's PV and then the rate again, I'm looking at monthly. So I've divided my annual rate by 12 and then the number of payments mine's over five years. So that's 60 months and then the payment to be made each period or each month, which cannot change over the life of the annuity. And then the future value, in this case, it will be zero and whether the payments are due at the beginning or the end of the period, zero for end, one for beginning, close parentheses. And the present value is 22,477 and 52 cents. The MPV calculates the net present value of an investment by using a discount rate and a series of future payments, negative values and income positive values. So let's take a look, starting with the discount rate and then the cash flows, which need to be equally spaced for years one, two and three. Close parentheses and then I'm going to add on my initial investment. Now I don't include this in the cash flows because it happens at the beginning of the investment period. So there's no discounting of this value. We just add it on at the end. And you can see we have a positive MPV. So this project is worthwhile. Now 
the MPV function here requires cash flows to be equally spaced at the end of each period. And if that doesn't apply to your projects, then you'd be better off using the X NPV function, which allows you to specify the dates. The IRR function returns the internal rate of return for a series of cash flows at equal intervals. The syntax is straightforward with the values being a reference to the cells containing the cash flows. Now these must contain at least one positive and one negative value and IRR uses the order of values to interpret the order of cash flows. And then the guess, and this is optional, it represents what you estimate the IRR will be. In most cases, you can omit the guess. If you omit it, it will use 10% and it uses an iterative technique for calculating IRR. Starting with the guess, it then cycles through the calculation until the result is accurate within point. 0.0001%. If it can't find a result that works after 20 tries, you'll get the num error. Nearly everyone who uses Excel works with dates. A super handy function is EO month, short for end of month, which returns the last day of the month before or after a start date. For example, if I enter EO month here and reference the date in column B, as my start date, and then I want to add or subtract the number of months in column C. Let's close parentheses. You can see the result. Now it's important to note that only whole numbers are recognized by the EO month function. So 1.7 months would be rounded down to one. Now as a bonus tip, there is no start of month function, but you can also use EO month to find the start of the month. Taking this formula here where it's found the end of the previous month, you can simply add one to it and now it's the start of the current month. The eDate function rolls the date serial number, ignoring any time element, forward or back based on the number of months specified in the month's argument. For example, eDate for the date in column B plus or minus the months here returns a date forward or back accordingly. So let's copy that down and we'll just fill without formatting and then to see how many days it's been adjusted by. We can take this value minus this one and we get 31 days there, minus 28, 29 and so on. Now notice in the last example, it's adjusting by 6.8. However, only whole numbers are recognized. So Excel rounds it down to six. As a financial modeler, you'll typically be working with dates a lot. The network days international function returns the number of working days between two dates, excluding weekends and holidays. For example, we can calculate the number of work days between the start and end dates. Now I should point out that network days international is inclusive of the start and end dates. For example, using network days international, I can specify this start date this end date, and then I can choose from these weekend types. Now I actually have the weekend type typed in here, so I'm going to select that cell. And then I have an optional argument for listing the holidays. So I've got a list of holidays here. Let's absolute reference those, close parentheses on network days, and you can see it returns 20. Let's just copy it down. And we get the results accordingly. Now we can see the different weekend types Weekend type one is Saturday and Sunday. Weekend two is Sunday, Monday, and so on. Not many people know that you can also exclude other days from the work week by specifying them in array where zero is a work day and one is a non-work day. For example, here I've specified that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are work days and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are non-work days. So I can write my network days formula by referencing these cells and then in the weekend argument, I can reference this cell here, which contains the array of weekend and work days. I can also write it into the formula. For example, let's select those dates and then instead of referencing a cell, I'm going to type them in. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are work days. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are not work days. Close parentheses and we get the same result. I hope you found this tutorial useful. You can download the file from the link here and if you like this video please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more and why not share it with your friends who might also find it useful thanks for watching